Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and Beast. And I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Our producer going forward is our buddy Elliot Bowman, who will be uh, taking go. over here as the GM Shuffle producer. Elliot, he is a Indianapolis Colts fan. So uh, it's been a rough season for him, Michael, here, uh, as we expected a lot of things from the Colts. But Elliot's now along for the ride for us. So make sure to find Elliot at Elliot underscore Bowman, that's B-A-U-M-A-N, uh, is where you can find him on Twitter. You can tweet all the uh, Indianapolis Colts takes to him. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, he's going to uncover that ticket that you have for Tua, but Elliot's also a Missouri <laughs> Tiger fan. Yeah. You know, went to the University of Missouri, <laughs> one of the great schools, Seth Wickersham, uh, Wright Thompson. There's been a lot of great writers come out oh, of yeah. there. So welcome, Elliot. We love to have you. Indianapolis, great town. Uh, as an Indianapolis resident, this I'd like to know, Elliot. What do you consider the best steakhouse in Indianapolis? Ooh, this is it. It's very much debated. For the uh, it's a, he, he, he says Elmo's is the easy answer. Elmo's is the wrong answer. I mean, <laughs> Elmo's you only go for the shrimp cocktail and, and get your nose cleared out. But what is the truly best steakhouse? I there's a place called Peterson's is what I'm I'm told outside of town a little bit. Is that true? I think we're still investigating to see what's true, but Elliot's shaking his head back there. He said he's going to go with Elmo's. He's a guy that he loves the the mainstream oh, steakhouse that everybody talks about. I've never been to Indianapolis. I know about Elmo's. That's how popular Elmo's is. But uh, maybe Elmo's one day. Is, great Super Bowl there, Femi, even though the yep. Patriots lost. It, it, it mm -hmm. says great town because you can walk around it. And, you know, when we first went there in 85, I think, or 86, I think it was 86 was the first year there, the combine came. The town was just really small. And now it's kind of the downtown area is electric. It's got so many great restaurants. It's it's a fun downtown. It really is. Great arena where the Pacers play. Tremendous mm -hmm. arena there. And, you know, obviously the, the dome is is great. And just the, the, the vibe of the downtown because of, of that, that stadium. And what one thing about it is even though the combine's there, I mean, there's more events going on down there than I've ever seen. There's the, I mean, you know, there's the, the twirling championship. You go from the twirling championship with little seven and eight, nine year old girls to the waste management uh, product showing of all the, you know, the sewer, sewer things and tr how to handle waste management I'm all in one day. I mean, it's, it's really kind of remarkable. Yeah, it's crazy. We'll have to maybe one year, maybe this, this upcoming year, we'll take the GM shuffle pod on the road, maybe to cover the NFL combine. That'd be a lot of fun. Great. We yeah, we like should that. do it. We should definitely look into that. Um, but let's get this going here on the pod and we'll stay in the AFC South or our Elliot, uh, our producer is always uh, keeping a keen eye on the Tennessee Titans, Michael. They kind of shocked the football world, at least in my opinion, they shocked the football world, firing general manager John Robinson after seven seasons. Robinson was 66 and 43. His record while he was the GM of the Titans, they were, they're in line right now to be a third straight AFC South division winner here. Um, why do you think they made this decision here uh, late in the season? Well, I think you got to, you know, first of all, they, he just got, he and Vrabel just got extensions, right, after their mm -hmm. season last year. And so if he was going to get fired for bad drafts, which he's had a few of them, right? I mean, he's had a few bad drafts and a, and a few bad trades, like all of us have. So, uh, but he made a great decision to hire Vrabel. So you've got to give him credit for that. But if he were going to get fired for bad drafts, he would have never got a contract extension. To me, this is all about that plane ride coming back from Green Bay. Mm. So – there is no alcohol allowed on planes by league regulations, okay? Even though I've been on team planes where, you know, there has been alcohol on it, and, and the general manager that was – or the, 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 the guy who was in charge of the plane was drinking out of – you know, drinking Coors Light like there was no tomorrow, you know. Uh, I won't mention who the punter was, but anyway, that's mm -hmm. another story. But it, with no regard. So uh, th there's no alcohol on planes leaving home. I mean, and, and it makes sense, right, because – a, you don't want the players to to get into trouble when they get in their cars, and B, you, you don't want to create a problem on the plane. So, when when Todd Dowling got sus, got a DUI, that alerted the NFL that what was going on, because they didn't drive from Green Bay back to to, to Nashville, they flew, so they didn't hit any bars along the way, right? So there had to be, just by assumption, there had to be alcohol on that plane. And if John Robinson is the head of the corporation and he's in charge of all things Tennessee Titans off the field, uh, this lays at his lap. I think that's mm -hmm. one thing. I think the other thing that causes this consternation is simply this. 
you can't embarrass your head coach. So Mike Vrabel, two days before the draft, says we're not trading A.J. Brown. He's going to be on the team. Yeah. And then they trade A.J. Brown. And if you go back and listen to the, to the interview with Vrabel, I mean, Vrabel was pissed, polite, political, but it bothered the hell out of him because he was embarrassed. He got embarrassed. He got embarrassed, and it showed that there really was an alignment within their corporation. Because if, if you and I are running a team, we and, and we're talking about trading A.J. Brown, we're either in agreement not to or we're in agreement to. Like, it can't be I'm trading him, I don't care what you think. And, and the value that they ended up getting back I don't think was enough, B, A, and B, it wouldn't have cost that much more to get him, to sign him. Mm-hmm. So I think those two things and the fact that Vrabel's winning with a really bad roster that Robinson has to be accountable for. Yeah, there's some good players in there. Obviously, drafting Derrick Henry gets Jeffrey Simmons. He takes a chance on him on an injury. But there's too many Khalif Farleys. There's too many Isaiah Wilsons. There's too many of these guys that aren't. And the team isn't talented enough. And I think at some point, the combination of those two events, not the drafting, is why John's not there. You know, that's really interesting. That the, I didn't even put the Todd Downing thing into perspective on thinking about why he was dismissed and parted ways with the Tennessee Titans but also on the A.J. Brown situation, because I we all remember the, the the war room shot of the Tennessee Titans that draft night. Mike Vrabel didn't look like he was too happy after they made that trade. Then they select a trail on Burks out of Arkansas. Do you think it's just a coincidence that this happened after the Eagles game when they saw A.J. Brown up close and personal no. and he went off for two touchdowns and 100-plus yards? I think, to me, it's easy for you to draw that straight line. But I think this has been in the works. And I think because we haven't heard what the NFL investigation is, we haven't heard the outcome. We know that the, that the Tennessee Titans know what that investigation is, right? Mm-hmm. And so I don't think I, – I think they're, they're, they're are kind of similar, but they're not. I, I think that the A.J. Brown was a residual effect of it, and then he goes off. But I think this has a lot to do with the, the alcohol consumption on that airplane. And it just couldn't have been Todd Dowling, right? Yeah. Like, okay, he got the DUI, but there was more. And if you're allowing that to happen and you're in charge of the program, that, that's a fireable offense. That's a fireable offense. Now, that's, this is all speculation on my part, but to me it makes no sense to fire John for bad drafts, for bad general managing, when you, you just gave him an extension. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that's what it has to do with. And once this report comes out, if the league ever releases it, or we find out that the, that the Titans have, been, have four, had a four-foot, a second-round draft pick or got fined $2 million, whatever it is, that responsibility ultimately lays at the feet of the general manager because he does have that authority in that building. Again, you know, we all have titles of general managers, right? Mm-hmm. I think fans don't understand this. We all have titles of general manager. But not all general managers carry the same political capital or the same power, right? John Robinson has a lot of power in Tennessee. I was a general manager in Cleveland. You know, Joe Banner was the president. He had all the power. He made all the decisions. It was in his contract, and I accepted that, and I was fine with it to get into the league. I understand that. And like Tom Telesco at at the Chargers, he doesn't have full autonomy to do everything he wants to do. Sometimes you have the title of general manager, and basically you're there to organize the college and the pro scouting departments. That's really what it is. Mm-hmm. So, But Robinson, much like George Payton in Denver, they had full responsibility to be the true general manager with that authority without having any outside influence. And so when you do have that and something goes wrong, you're going to be in trouble. Last thing on this before we move on here, because I'm sure there are some fans saying that doesn't some of this fall at the feet of Mike Vrabel who's the head coach, and Todd Downing as the offensive coordinator would report directly to Mike Vrabel. Do you think that Vrabel should be punished or, or any sort of fine in any sort of way here because of what happened on that well, plane? I mean, ultimately it does, but, I mean, who who's more I- indispensable, Vrabel or, or John Robinson? Yeah, sometimes it's that I mean, It just comes – I mean, like, let's not confuse this, right? For all the converse – like, I've said this a million times. I'm not a good general manager – I'm not a good personnel evaluator with a bad coach. I'm a good one with, with Belichick. I, like, I know like how that works, right? And we'll talk about that when we get to Houston in, in another block. But to me, you know, John, I don't know if John and, and Vrabel have ever been on the same page in terms of how they select players or build that roster. I really don't. And so, 
you know, the, the Titans are a, a, a well-coached team with not a lot of talent. And, yes, Rabel probably has to assume some responsibility for what happens on that airplane. There's no denying it. But ultimately, the guy in charge is the guy who has been in charge, the general manager. It's interesting to see what comes of this NFL investigation when they ultimately release it, if they ever release it, from what happened on that plane where Todd Downing unfortunately got a DUI after their win over the Green Bay Packers. Michael, let's go over to what's going on in Big D. The Cowboys are rolling this season, 9-3, and three, but there's been a lot of discussion about wide receiver, free agent wide receiver, Odell Beckham Jr. He was doing the whole visit with the Dallas Cowboys Monday, Tuesday, went to the Mavericks game with the whole team. They rolled out the red carpet to see if Odell Beckham would want to come, but after the visit on Tuesday, there were reports that Odell Beckham, there's some concerns from the Cowboys that Odell Beckham is not ready to play this year. Here's what Jerry Jones had to say when he was asked about Odell Beckham Jr. and his free agency and potentially joining the Dallas Cowboys. Well, I'm not confident at all. And so uh, that's the issue. Now, we all realize that uh, uh, that issue of health, that issue of availability is here every time. Uh, just this one is... Uh, very obvious and very pointed toward his injury that he had occurred last year in the Super Bowl. So uh, we've got a good beat on that. We've got a great read on his career. It's not like a draft pick coming at you. You've got a lot of history here, and you can take a good look at everything, not only the obvious, and that's his performance, but also uh, any issues regarding health. So all of this, uh, we've got to come in with our eyes wide open, and it has to be addressed. And that's when you see if you can uh, make a deal or not. That audio courtesy of 105.3, the fan down there in Dallas on the Sean and RJ show. Uh, Michael, what do you make of what Jerry had to say about Odell and the injury concern since he's only 10 months removed from the surgery? Well, we know this, the media campaign, the media never takes into account that the player with a, with a huge name might be declining in play. I mean, we see it in the NBA all the time, right? We think this guy's a great – we think James Harden's still a great player when he's not. You know, I had this argument with somebody the other day. Joel Embiid's a great, great talent player. No, he's a great talent. That doesn't make anybody better. So there's this perception that always carries with the player regardless, regardless of age, right? Julio Jones gets traded from Atlanta. Oh, my God, John Robinson made a great trade. There's Julio. Julio's on Tampa. There's Julio. Ain't the same Julio. Then is then, now is now. And what Jerry's saying there really simply is, is Jerry's saying, this kid's not healthy. This kid's probably not going to impact any team this year. Again, I'm translating Jerry's words here. Mm -hmm. But Jerry's saying, A, he's not going to impact the team this year. He's not really worth. And he wants a contract of multi-years. And he wants a lot of money. And if you're the fool, if you're the, if you're the, if you're the patsy in the, in the game, you know, Warren Buffett has a great line. He said, if you're the, you know, if you go to a poker table, and, and and you're the and, and you're the pigeon. If you go to the poker table and you can't figure out who the pigeon is at the table, mm -hmm. you are, right? <laughs> so this is a poker game, and if you're dumb enough to give Odell extended years and a lot of money, without the assurances that he's going to play at the level that you need him to play at, then you're the pigeon. Then it's the most dumb thing you could possibly do. And if his agent can buffalo these teams into doing that out of desperation, then God bless them. But this is where it separates the NFL. The doctors control this. Mm -hmm. And so the doctors will say, hey, Odell's healthy, but he's really not 100%. Why won't Odell work out for anybody? Because he doesn't want anybody to see he's lost juice. He doesn't have the same power in his lower body. He doesn't want, to, he doesn't want anybody to get up close and personal to where he is. He's a name. He's a brand. But that brand and name don't translate into the same level of play. We have such a hard time with this because the media refuses to evaluate players honestly. They just evaluate names. And look, let's be honest here. Odell gets clicks. So when the worldwide leader covers Odell, it's more clicks. People want to know what's going on. But Odell's not the same player. Odell's not the same player. I think Odell's camp, it's like they're trying to sell a movie trailer without letting you actually see the movie. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, Femi. That's a great point. I mean, and if you're the pigeon in the poker table, then you're going to get played. But if you understand that, you can't do that. You can't play that way. Mm -hmm. And so this is about – this isn't about we add Odell to our team. You know, this is about can Odell help our team. And what? the answer to that is probably not. 
because he's injury. That knee coming off of two ACL surgeries. What do you think the chances that he plays at a high level within the next six months? Probably not very well. Could he do it in a year? Maybe. Maybe. Mm -hmm. And that's as a Cowboys fan, I've always been wondering. I'm like, okay, we're having this discussion, but when could he actually play? Because I think we're just disregarding that this guy tore his ACL the day before Valentine's Day. That's when the Super Bowl was. This is 10 months. I think Adrian Peterson has everybody kind of confused as to what the normal rehab time is for an ACL injury just because he was remarkable and had an MVP season like nine months after tearing his ACL. But Odell it tore it on February 13th. He still needs a lot of time, and I don't see why, how he would be impactful for any team, whether it's the Giants or the Bills or the Dallas Cowboys, the three teams that he visited with here. So uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to bring him in, honestly. And, and even if he was able to play – uh, trying to implement a guy in the playoffs who you haven't had any sort of reps with seems like a bad idea. I mean, it's just you're just wasted reps. I mean, you're better off bringing James Washington back. He was in camp for you. At least he's going to be healthy and can run. He's young. I mean, I, it, you know, it's great to add a name, but how many times do you add a name to your team that doesn't fulfill the name? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, look, the, 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 the Eagles traded for Robert Quinn. Great. Oh, my God. They got a great pass rush. And now he's on IR. He's hurt. Obviously, Robert Quinn's not the same Robert Quinn that had 18, 17 and a half sacks last year. So, you know, the Eagles are fortunate enough. They can kind of scurry that along. But to me, you can't make that. If you're Buffalo, you, you're saying, OK, I'm going to take Isaiah McKenzie off the field for Odell. Well, who's the better player? I know that America thinks Odell's the better player, but is he? Like, that's, that's the hard thing. And fans just see names. They only see names. And the worldwide leader only sees names. Yeah, If you could guarantee me that Odell was, is 100% healthy and he's the guy that was playing for the Rams in January and February, bring him on. I'd love to have him. He had a hell of a Super Bowl prior to the injury, caught a touchdown pass in that game. But it is just not, it's not living in reality to think that he would be that player just so short removed from the surgery there. Um, Michael, speaking of short removed and some – Interesting ideas. We talked about this on the podcast on Monday. Baker Mayfield was released by the Carolina Panthers. Now, it was reported that Baker Mayfield asked for this release there from Carolina. We didn't think that he would make his way through waivers, or we didn't think that he would be claimed on waivers. But to our surprise, the Los Angeles Rams went ahead and put in a claim for Mayfield to be their quarterback. Now, there's the report that's come out that John Wolford dealing with the neck injury. There's a chance, Michael, that after just three days of being on the team, that Baker Mayfield could start for the L.A. Rams tonight. We'll get into that game in full coming up in this next segment. But what did you make of the Rams picking up Baker Mayfield here uh, through the waiver wire? Well, it tells you John Wolford's not healthy. And John Wolford's a little guy. And this is how desperate they're – I mean, they know that if they put Bryce Perkins out there, they have no chance to win. So they rather play somebody who's played in a game and just cut the playlist down to 10 plays, let's say. I think it's going to be really challenging. I mean, the fact that th that, that stadium will be filled with Raider fans and Baker will be playing a road game – Look, Baker didn't play well. I mean, let's just put that out there. Again, this is a name player that didn't play well. If Baker would have played well, Matt Rule wouldn't be at Nebraska right now. You know, that's, uh, that's fair to say, right? And mm -hmm. maybe that's Matt Rule's fault. Maybe it's Ben McAdoo's fault. I don't know. But, but I watched all the games, and Baker was very, very disappointing. And for the Rams, to me, the million three is you're basically saying, we're going to look at you, Baker. There's a, probably a good chance, I would say, better than 70% that Matt Stafford doesn't play next year. How do I know Ooh. that? It's just, it's just I, I have a sense of that, right? Okay. I think, it's, I think he's beaten up, his body's tore down, and I think there's more to life than just coming back. And so if he doesn't come back, right, if he doesn't come back, then where are the Rams? They don't have any draft picks. They have no capital. You think Aaron Donald wants to play on a team with no quarterback? So I think what the Rams are saying is we'll take the million three this year and we'll evaluate Baker to see if maybe, maybe he could be our guy for next season. Because let's face it, based on the way Baker played this year, there's no team who's going to give him a starting job. He's looking at a minimum salary contract next year, at best, based on the way he played this year. So they get a chance to see him. If they put him in the game tonight, I mean, like it's going to be bootlegs and nakeds. It's what it's going to be the whole mm -hmm. game. It's what, that's what it was with Wolford. I mean, it's going to be straight bootlegs and nakeds, and he's going to have a – I would have think it's be a hard time for him to execute. And, look, the Raiders' defense aren't, isn't great. So maybe they can make some, but this Ram offensive line isn't good either. So to me, I, I, I would just say this is a look-see. If he plays tonight, it, you know it's a short playlist. You kind of dropped a bombshell there with the Matthew 7. Now, I know you're not reporting this, saying that this is 100% going to happen. You said that you have a hunch that there's a 70% chance that Stafford 
does but not it's come more, back next it, year. Yeah. It's more than a hunch. It's talking okay. to a lot of people in the league that tell me that, you know, that maybe Stafford just his body is breaking down. And I think hmm. with his wife, Kelly, having gone through what she went through, I mean, where yep. do we want to go with this? The kid's such a great competitor, and he's so tough. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had to put him on IR because he probably would have wanted to keep playing. But what more does he have to play for? You know, and where is this team going? I mean, let's be honest here. Again, name. Matthew Stafford didn't play well this year. He, he was a top-10 quarterback last year for the Rams. He was far from that this year. Was it his fault? I don't think so. I mean, the line was bad. They didn't have another receiver. I mean, a lot of things went into this. But, I mean, does he come back? I, I don't know. I mean, he's made enough money in his career. I can't mm-hmm. speak for him, but I think his body's breaking down. Yeah, he won the Super Bowl last year. That's kind of the last thing you'd want to check off as a player in your career there. On the Baker side, real quick, before we take a break, how, how could he possibly look good in this situation? The Rams have no Cooper Cup. There's no Allen Robinson. The offensive line is beaten up. If this is a look-see, I mean, this guy's getting set up to fail damn near. <laughs> well, I think that, you know, they ran the ball last week against Seattle, so I'm sure they're going to try to run the ball this week against the Raiders, and they're going to try to limit what he can do and hope their defense, which is the fourth-best red zone defense in all of football, can keep the game tight and, you know, give it a chance in the fourth quarter like they did against the, the Seattle team last week. I mean, they had the game in the fourth quarter. They played it. They made a few plays offensively. They had the running game going better than they had it all season. I mean, look, it's just you're trying to manage it as best you can. It has to go perfectly. You've got to make a play in a kicking game. You've got to make a play on defense. You know, and the Raiders have done a good job this year of protecting the football. Last week against the Chargers, they turned it over twice and still was able to win the game. So the Raiders have to protect the football, and, and they've got to be able to play from in front and force Baker to become a drop-back passer. And then, then we'll start to see some problems. Well, we'll get more into that game Thursday Night Football tonight. When we come back, we're going to take our first break. This is the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi. All right, Michael, we have Thursday Night Football tonight on Amazon Prime. Las Vegas Raiders and the Los Angeles Rams. Right now over at our show sponsor, DraftKings, the Rams are seven-point underdogs at home. Total sitting at 43. We've talked a little bit about this game on the other side. It sounds like John Wolford will go through the warm-ups, but if it looks like he's not able to play, it'll be Baker Mayfield starting as the QB1 for L.A. And the line has moved. I mean, it was six all week. Now it's mm-hmm. up to seven. So it, it's obviously moving. And, and uh, you know, look, uh, uh, this is a big game for the Raiders because, uh, yeah. you know, this is a game that Raiders on a two-game winning streak. They've got to kind of feel the momentum and go forward. And we know the Rams are a wounded team. I don't think Aaron Donald's going to play tonight. So that hurts them. You know, it's funny. My, my five-year-old grandson tells his mother this morning, he says, Dominic, he says, his father calls, who's in Los Angeles, get ready to play the game. And his father calls, and he says to him, he says, Dad, I just hope number five and, and number 99 don't play tonight. Well, I mean, you know. <laughs> 99 power of, <laughs> I mean, I don't even know how the hell he even knows who five or 99 is, but he should be scouting for some teams, exactly. I think. He's a sharp kid. Uh, yeah, obviously. Uh, but I, 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 to me, you know, this is about the Raiders. This is about them tonight. How do they want to play? Josh Jacobs has been really effective last week. I think they've really improved. They've added Jerry Tiller to their inside defensive line. That's given them some juice. They played better. Ellis Hobbs has played better, getting Perryman back on defense. Mm-hmm. Look, they're not great on defense, but they're, they've been functional defensively, and they've gotten off the field. They've been very bad on third down, but they've gotten off the field. So this is going to come down to Carr protecting the football and then cashing in with the red zone. Like I said in the other block, the Rams are a good red zone team. And because of that, they can keep the game somewhat tight. And, and I think it'll be a good game. And look, who's happier than Al, Al Michaels? I mean, A, he can drive to the game. He can, go to, he, can go to, he can go to Toscano's after the game. I mean, who's got it better than him? <laughs> he's, he's, uh, maybe he's earned it after the slate of Thursday night games we've had over the last six I, weeks. I so. disagree. <laughs> like, I think these Thursday night games are all good. I think they're fun. They're compelling. I mean, they're great. They're single entities. Like, I don't, I don't, I mean, we, you know, we can't paint a Rembrandt every night. Like, I mean, it's like, yeah. seriously, like, no, that's what do we want? Like, Mahomes I mean, every night is fun, what we want. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this will be a fun game because we'll get, you know, the, the Raider fans will be in force in Los Angeles tonight. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a Raider town. When I lived in LA for the couple of years of that, when I was writing the book, uh, there, there was, uh, I mean, I saw Raider shirts every single day. You know, and, and it was – there's still a huge, huge Raider fan base in that town. And, frankly, with the Raiders in Las Vegas, and now that we play 17 games, the Raiders will always have almost 10 home games every year, whether it's the – you know, they'll at least have nine because when they play the Chargers in oh, Los yeah. Angeles, it'll always be the Raiders fans. 
Yeah, it'll be loud and uh, a lot of silver and black on our TV coming up later tonight. Uh, the Raiders, though, you mentioned that big game for them. They're five and seven, taking on the Rams as seven point favorites tonight. Then they come back and play New England on extra rest. Then they visit Pittsburgh. Is there a chance that after all the discussion about a month ago about trying to get Josh McDaniels out of there, is there a chance the Raiders could make the playoffs? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, they still have to play San Francisco. I think it's going to be hard. Look, I think the Raiders have to take it one game at a time. I hate to sound mm-hmm. cliche-ish, but they're not good enough to look ahead. This is like I'm not sure they're good enough to be a seven-point dog, a seven-point favorite to any team, right? You know, mm-hmm. and, and I just looked at the thing. Aaron Donald's been ruled out, so yeah, he's, he's out with an ankle. So, you know, I mean, look, I don't know how Wolford's going to play. He's got a neck injury. I mean, like, seriously, you're going to put a guy out there with a neck injury and you're going to have a hard time protecting him? I, I don't know. I mean, I think the Raiders are a really good example of they weren't as bad as everybody made them out to be when they were when trying to fire Josh McDaniels, you know, when they went on that campaign. Because if you just watch the game, they were playing with effort. They were playing with intensity. They just weren't playing very well. They turned the ball. They couldn't turn it over. Their defense really wasn't to the level. Look, they're going to have to they're, – they're, they're going to have to get a couple good drafts in that team to really be there. But they're laying a foundation of toughness. And, and give Josh Jacobs credit because he's responded. You know, he, he bet on himself. The Raiders didn't pick up the fifth year. And I've been more impressed with his pass-catching skills than ever before. And his ability to continually wear and tear the team down, his speed to me when that run against Seattle and yeah. some of the runs he made against the Chargers was really impressive. Who wins tonight? I mean, I, you're asking me, look, I'm rooting for the Raiders. I'm yeah. going to have my silver and black on. God damn it, I want them to win. Oh, just do great, <laughs> young man. Just do fucking great. Oh, fuck. He, you know, uh, I, I wish he were here to see this. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean – I mean, I'm rooting for the Raiders. I, I, I Look, I'm always nervous about a game, especially a young team or a, a team that struggled. When they become the favorite, how do they handle that? That, that mindset, mm-hmm. how do you handle that? How do you motivate your team when everybody's telling you, you know, you got a chance to make the playoffs if we just win the next three? How yeah. do you handle that, right? And what you got to do is really you got to be an asshole. You got to say, hey, fellas, look, nothing matters except tonight. If we don't win tonight, you can forget about anything. Tonight's the only thing that matters. And and if we win tonight, you'll get four days off. If we don't win tonight, it's going to be hard. So, look, you just got to kind of keep them in the moment. And you've got to be able to execute. I think Raheem Morris does a good job of limiting big plays. And they've just got to execute. The Raiders have not been great on third down. So they're going to have to have a better third down plan tonight. And they're going to have to play from in front. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that you make up. Teams that are not used to being the favorites now – expected to win by margin. It's an interesting dynamic that we'll see play out yeah. later on this season. And you know what's going to happen? Here's what drives me crazy, and I think most young coaches should really understand this. Head coaches, like every game, when you're a favorite, everybody wants the game to be over in the first quarter. Mm-hmm. Like that like that isn't going to happen tonight, right? That's not going to happen. Like the, the Colts game against Dallas, right? Dallas got behind, what, 10 nothing in that game, right? And then they end up winning by a fortune. So, like, what you have to do is get your team prepared for you got to we got to play 60 minutes. We're going to win this game in the last eight minutes of the fourth quarter. That's where we're going to win the game. Like, we're going to keep fighting. But this note, the media is driving into them that the game's going to be over in eight minutes to go in the first quarter. That's never the case. Yeah. The, the Rams have paid professionals on their team as well, even though they're struggling this season. Michael, let's take another break. On the other side, we'll get to fixing the Houston Texans and also some breaking news in the NFL. All right, Michael, before we get to the Houston Texans, we got some breaking news from around the NFL. NFL Network's Ian Rappaport tweeting out moments ago that the Falcons are looking to the future, making a QB switch to rookie Desmond Ritter as their starter. Your reaction to now Marcus Mariota going to the bench, coming out of the bye, and it'll be Ritter going forward to end this season. I mean, I think that, you know, look, I I think Arthur's – Smith has done a tremendous job, a tremendous job of, of, of taking his assets and utilizing to the best of his ability. You know, his offensive line has played better than I thought they would. They've been able to run the ball on every single team. They just haven't gotten enough play out of the quarterback position. And Mariota, even though he was the second pick overall in the draft, just hasn't been able to show that level to throw the football. And so why not give Ryder a chance? I mean, where are they going? I mean, they're, 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 they've lost to Tampa – you know, they've lost to Carolina. They've lost to New Orleans, right? So they're not going to win the South, and they're not going to be a play a wild card team. So let's get going. And, look, I think Ryder can execute the offense 
as well as Mariota did in terms of they're going to hand the ball off, we're going to run bootlegs, we're going to run the six-back attack. So, like, let's see what we have. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's given up. I think it's kind of like gives yourself a chance. Plus, Ryder started a lot of games. He's played in games. I think it'll be really good. Yeah, I don't think they're giving up on anything because Tampa has a pretty tough game in San Francisco on Sunday. If the Bucs were to lose that game, and they're an underdog, they're three-point dogs in the game. So, according to the chalk, they would be losing. Atlanta's only a game back in that division. Now that division has been atrocious, but they're still squarely in the thick of that division race and could be hosting a playoff game, which sounds crazy. But uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how Ritter does as a rookie. He showed some flashes in the preseason, um, but it's, they're going to him now with the season kind of being on the line, Uh, a third round pick out of Cincinnati. He was on that Bearcats team that made the CFP last year, the first group of five team to do that. So he's got a lot of playing experience at the collegiate level. Now we'll see what he does here uh, in the NFL right now, the Falcons on a bye, but then next week they will be back at it once again there. Uh, but Michael, the Houston Texans, I know you wanted to get to this team here, this organization, one ten and one right now, the regular season, they're taking on the Dallas Cowboys coming up on Sunday as 16 and a half point underdogs, but the Texans made the decision to go back to Davis Mills as the starting quarterback, but just from an overall organizational standpoint what went wrong in Houston and how should they go about fixing it you know I I think what's gone wrong in Houston is simply alignment right and so when Houston hires Nick Cesario to come in Nick has been brought up in the same system that I was in since Cleveland of 91 and that system for lack of a better term people people call it the Patriot system Mm -hmm. And people are very anti to that because they really don't understand what it means, right? So the Patriot system is not about, you know, Belichick talking to the media. The Patriot system is a foundation to which you build an organization. And it really starts with the secret sauce within it is player development. It starts with coaches that, that understand their role. It starts with coaches that understand their roles to develop talent. It starts with a head coach who's separate from the assistants, who can demand from the assistants. It starts with game-specific each week, changing your system each week. It starts with players that are adaptable, that love football, that, are, that have multidimensional skills. So when Nick goes down to Houston, you know, he's looking for a head coach. And people say, well, you can't hire a Patriot guy. A Patriot way won't work. Well, the problem is, for me and for Nick, We only really understand the game through that vein. We really don't. We only understand the game through that way. I watch a different game than other people watch based on how I was trained. Mm -hmm. And so for me to go and take somebody like David Culley, who's never been in that system, we would be talking – I would be talking Italian and he would be talking Chinese. It just doesn't work, right? And, and And then he comes back and hires Lovey, which is the same scenario. And so for me, the biggest mistake in Houston has been alignment. If Nick is going to be the general manager, then Nick has to get somebody who is aligned with the philosophical nature of what he believes in, which is player development, which is under roles of defining the roles of every player, holding players accountable, working extra hard. It's not about being a dictator. It's not about putting a pencil behind your ear. It's about a structured program. And unless you've been in that program, it's really challenging. I I was talking to a college coach the other day who had worked for a lot of different places, and and he's like, you know, having been in New England and been other places, it's kind of like I can get it. Like everybody thinks New England does what everybody does. Like if somebody said, did you read Gridiron Genius and you're a football coach, people say, well, no, we do that. I mean, I I remember talking to Jason Garrett at a wedding, at Scott Turner's wedding. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, we were talking about all different things. And, you know, we do that. We do that. Like that mentality that he has is the prevalent mentality. Everybody thinks they do what is in the Patriot way, but they don't do it that way. And there lies the difference. And Nick, who should have known that he's only effective as a personnel guy with alignment from the head coach. This is what kills all of us in, in sports. Like, for me, if I would have stayed – thank God I got fired in Cleveland because I would have been a shitty GM for Mike Pettin. You know, I was a shitty GM for Jarob Chizinski. It just – for me, it didn't work. The reason I wanted to hire Josh McDaniels in Cleveland was to get alignment, to get alignment, to get somebody who saw the game the way I saw it. 
And, and I think that's the hard part. And so for, for, for Houston, before you even get to the first pick in the draft, before you even decide who's your quarterback, if they don't get alignment, it's never going to work. Is there someone out there that you think is ready to be a head coach that they could hire for this upcoming 2023 season? Now, Lovey's still the coach, and there haven't been anything about uh, any reports about making a change there. But I mean, you can read the tea leaves and how this is kind of going the way this te- season has gone. That I don't think Lovey is long for that job. Uh, who should be at the top of their list for someone that they would want to hire as a head coach? Well, they wanted to hire Brian Flores until he hit the lawsuit, which would mm-hmm. have been a really good hire for them. Because Brian, like Nick, has grown up in the system. Now, what I'm saying about hiring somebody that understands the system, I'm not saying you have to hire somebody who does it exactly the way Bill does. you got to hire somebody who understands how Bill does it, right? Mm-hmm. That's the difference. Mike Vrabel was never in New England as a coach, but Mike Vrabel understood the core tenets of the New England program. Mm-hmm. And then he applied his teachings and his methodology to that. You know, and holding players accountable, demanding from the assistants, doing all those things, being a head coach, right? It's like like the reason New England doesn't have a lot of experienced coaches on their staff is because when they hire veteran coaches who are not trained in this system, that the coaches get completely – they don't understand it. Like most coaches, I want to watch the last three games of our opponent. Well, New England's not going to do that. New England's only going to watch games that, that apply to their scheme as it applied to the team they're playing. That, that's a foreign concept to most teams. Now, is that the right way to do it? I don't know that, but I know that's the way I do it. And so, and that's the way Nick does it. And so for Nick not to have somebody with alignment, he's going to continue to have a disaster, and he's going to continue to hurt his career because he doesn't have this. And I think that's why you saw the Las Vegas Raiders go out and get – Dave Ziegler and Josh McDaniels kind of as a package deal in a sense because Ziegler coming from that area and understanding what it is in the Patriot way and McDaniels clearly having a grasp on that as well to where they can kind of be aligned and not really make a Patriots West but just kind of have the same alignment and see the game the same way and I think that that's probably and it's interesting because like I've never heard it described this way Michael I'm really glad that you brought it up because I think a lot of people always talk about how oh look at all these Belichick assistants who have failed as head coaches, like look at all these guys who have failed and have all struggled and then they go run back to New England. But this is the way you, what you're describing is probably one of the reasons why they don't have as much success as people think that they should have as head coaches. Right, because most of the t- I mean, the, what they're trying to do is run the New England system. But the guy who invented it, the guy who mastered it, it the, he's hard to duplicate. So it, it's challenging. And, and a lot of the coaches that have worked there really don't truly understand it. And then they hire coaches who are not accustomed to being in that system. Mm-hmm. Like, they're not accustomed to that. And so they, they, there's a lot of resentment. There's a lot, oh, I don't know. I don't have any say here. You know, most coaches on most teams, you know, the running back coach of the, let's say, the Carolina Panthers, he wants to be able to pick who the players are. Well, that's not the way it is in the New England system. He'll have a say. He'll have a voice. But he's not controlling the talent on the team. And for some coaches, that really becomes a problem which is fine. And so it's hard to get everybody to see it the same way you see it, you know? And so it's very challenging. When Scott Pioli went to Kansas City, he hired Todd Haley. Todd Haley doesn't see it. Todd Haley didn't get it. You know, it's challenging. It's challenging to find somebody that can get that and, and is willing to do it within their own way. I mean, when Matt Patricia went to Detroit, Matt thought he knows it, but Matt really didn't know it. Matt was part of it. He couldn't master it. And Bob Quinn, who was his general manager, truly didn't understand how, what the mechanisms were to how to develop it. And, and so it's, it, it takes a organizational structure, and, and it's hard to find. And it's hard to find that specific guy to do it. You know, Nick would have been better off taking a college coach and training him into how he wanted him mm-hmm. and being that kind mm-hmm. of than he is hiring a veteran guy. Because, I mean, it makes no sense. You hire Lovey, who runs Covered Tampa, too, and Nick – that, that's not part of anything that they do. Lovey's going to play Tampa, too. This week, he's going to play it. Next week, he's going to play it the week after. Yeah. Whereas in the, the New England system, we may play Tampa, too, this week, but we may play zero blitz the next. That's fascinating stuff. I guess, what the, what can Casario do then now going forward as we kind of – well, last point on this here, because it's almost – does he need to convince ownership of, like, hey, here's a guy who I need to hire, or is it he needs to kind of just – 
go back to not go back to the well and and go to try to pick somebody from New England staff or somebody who understands it or somebody that is willing to learn. I guess what what, what advice would you have for him moving forward about how he can get that alignment in 2023 and beyond? I mean, what he has to do is try to convince the owner, the owners, the owner and his wife that the reason this is it's not Lovey's fault. It's not it's we're not aligned. And for you to be successful in any industry, in any industry, you need to get alignment. And alignment doesn't mean give the coach all the power. The alignment doesn't mean give me all the power. Alignment needs philosophically everybody needs to be on the same page. Why is Buffalo successful? Because Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean have alignment. They're aligned in how they see the game, right? They're aligned in how they see the game. And so that alignment allows them to be able to eliminate players, not find players. Well, that guy doesn't fit for what we want to do. You know, it's like Buffalo. You know, they want to have a nickel defense all the time. So, you know, they look for certain players that fit what their scheme is. Same thing with offensively. Whereas if you were me, you know, maybe that wouldn't work for me. I would want maybe a three technique that can play the run, you know, or somebody who was physical inside. I think that's kind of how it goes until Nick hasn't been able to communicate to the Houston ownership that alignment is more important than anything. And Nick can't overcome, as he's learning, he can't overcome deficiencies from the head coach, just like I learned it painfully. You know, you think you can become better, but you can't overcome the coach. I mean, it's really interesting stuff there. Michael, we'll take our final break. We'll get to Sunday's slate on the other side. This is the GM Shuffle. All right, Michael, before we get out of here, let's get to Sunday's slate. Starting in the Meadowlands, the Philadelphia Eagles taking on the New York Giants. Giants right now at our show sponsor, DraftKings, six and a half point underdogs total at 45 as the Eagles look to improve to 12 and one on the season. I mean, this is the second time the Eagles have been a touchdown favorite and it's gone under, right? It's gone back mm-hmm. to under seven. You know, uh, uh, I, I don't see it. I see this as a, you know, I think this is a hard game for the Giants because their speed of their defense is going to have a tough time. When you watch the Eagles last week offensively, their offensive line really controlled the game. And every throw that Hurt made in the game was somewhat of an easy throw. Now, Hurt throws a great deep ball. There's no denying that. He throws a great, I mean, the throw to A.J. Brown was incredible. That wasn't a touchdown, right? The one yep. that his foot stepped out of bounds, that was an incredible throw. But I, you, you've got to be able to play – the way they played Philly – Philly played Tennessee last week with their play-action pass to start the game to build the lead. I think it's the recipe for them to play against teams like the Giants who want to borrow the Washington game plan and run the ball and control the ball and take the ball away from the Philadelphia offense. I think this is important. I, I, I think Philly's got to be in the lead at halftime, and I think Philly's got to be able to make the Giants play catch-up because the Giants, we know this, they can only play one way. Yeah, I, I took some Giants at plus seven there just as a as a number grab with the, getting the touchdown and a division dog at home, but uh, I don't feel great about it. And if they struggle to stop that Philly run, and, and even if they sh- stop the run, Philly has shown that they have the ability to pass as well as we saw against the Tennessee Titans. So that's kind of a, a plug your nose and hope for the best kind of a situation for me at least. Uh, the Jets and the Bills, this is the rematch here. The Jets winning the first game in the Meadowlands, now going to Western New York. Buffalo laying nine and a half at home. Total 43 and a half. The Bills this week said that Von Miller is done for the rest of the season. A big loss for them going forward. But how do you think it plays into today's game or other Sunday's game, I should say, here in week 14? Well, I mean, look, the the Bills are about how do we – the Bills are the classic West Coast philosophy, right? We're going to throw the ball to get the lead, and we're going to pass rush to to extend the lead. I mean, that's their whole – that's their – philosophically, that's their alignment, Right. Bean believes it. McDermott believes it. And so all the players that they accumulate fit that model. Milano's safety in Boston College, now a linebacker. Von Miller can rush off the edge. They're just going to have to find a way to kind of pick up for Von Miller and take advantage of the Jets. I thought the Jets did a great job of pass protecting last week. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a hard game for Mike White up there in Buffalo. But the Jets have to slow the game down. They've got to slow the game down. And they've got to be able to stay on the field on third down, which they couldn't do against Minnesota, even though they dominated time of possession. But if they get behind in this game, it's going to be a challenge. And look, the Jets defense has to play really well. I mean, is Deion Dawkins going to play at left tackle? That's going to be critical. Because with Cuisenberry over there, they're not the same team offensively. And the Jets, for all the conversation about how good they are defensively, you can run the ball in them on the end zone. I think they're 17th in the National Football League in red zone efficiency. 
You know, and that's because teams can run the ball. When you can run the ball in, you become an easier team to play red zone wise. So I think it's a hard game for the Jets. This is their season here, Femi. I mean, they mm-hmm. got to win this one. I mean, they're also their 500, and New England's got the two game advantage of them in the win column for the wild card. Yeah, this is a massive game for the New York Jets. Mike White. Uh, He played well last week, all things considered, but I think this is a step up in competition going up against Buffalo. Speaking of those Vikings, they will be heading to Detroit this weekend to face the Lions. And this is the one that has the betting space kind of buzzing because you see the 10 and 2 Minnesota Vikings versus the 5 and 7 Detroit Lions. But yet it's the Lions who are the favorite in this game. Two point favorites, total 51. Uh, Michael, what do you think about this matchup? And it went up to two and a half, and it come back down mm-hmm. again. Look, when you watch the first game, the Lions lost 28-24. They missed two field goals. They blew it. I mean, they were yep. another one of those teams that got on the airplane saying, how the fuck did we lose to that team, right? You know, <laughs> they were another one that left Minneapolis International Airport saying, Jesus Christ, that was horrible, right? So I, I think, look, the way Goff has played, it, you know, he's been really effective. Their skill on offense, Detroit, they'll move the football. You know, they'll, they've just got to win the situation. They've got to play great in the red zone. And they've got to convert third downs. And I think their defense has played a lot better. I think it'll be a back-and-forth game. I think Minnesota will move the football. But I think Detroit has played better. I mean, when you watch Jacksonville game, even though it was a blowout, I mean, Jacksonville dropped a lot of passes, had opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I think Minnesota will as well. But for me, this is about Detroit. This is a huge moment for Detroit. They beat Minnesota last year in in Detroit as Mm -hmm. bad as they were. They should have beat them in Minnesota. This This, to me, is their – to me, this is a statement for them. I think they should. I, I can understand why the line has flipped. For me, I have it at, at Detroit being a 1.1 favorite. And when you break the teams down, actually, on my game codes, I mean, Detroit's more has is stronger in more areas mm. and the keys to winning than Minnesota is. Yeah, this is a playoff game for the Detroit Lions, and there are playoff games here on out to the rest of the regular season for them if they want to get to the postseason. But I think Dan Campbell, who we've been critical of on this podcast, has done a good job of helping turn things around there with the Lions. Well, but I mean, if you go back, you know, I, we could, we're critical of him. And then mm-hmm. when I went back and watched the Detroit for the first game, I'm like, Dan, what are we doing yeah. here? Like, he made yeah, a lot a, of bad decisions in that game that cost him that game. That was a tough one there for Dan Campbell. He said that's a game that is going to live with him until the day he dies. It seems a little extreme, but he did uh, <laughs> blow that game for them earlier this season. Browns. But, you know, the, the one thing I would say this, if you're, you know, the one thing yeah. you want to be able to do is, is pay close attention to teams playing really well in the last five games. I think that really matters, you know, and like Dallas is the best team in the last. Detroit's the third best team statistically over the last five weeks. Wow. They've been good, and they would be riding a five-game win streak if not for the issue that they had against the Buffalo Bills on Thanksgiving. Like, if it were not for again, Dan Campbell. Yeah, once again for Dan Campbell. Browns at the Bengals. I'm sure you got, you got a Dan Campbell Coach of the Year ticket, too. You're hitting there with that Tua ticket, don't you? You I, probably I, have a Dan Campbell. I know you have a secret Dan Campbell you know ticket, what? too. It's not so secret, Michael. I went ahead and bet it earlier this week. 200 to 1. I knew it. See? I knew it. 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 There's, no, there's, no, there's no Tua ticket, but there is a Dan Campbell ticket that was purchased oh, there's a earlier ticket. this week. You just don't want to admit it. You just don't want to admit no it. <laughs> the Bengals and the Browns, Cincinnati hosting Cleveland as six point favorites, total 47. Second game for Deshaun Watson, but the Bengals have been rolling over the past month. Well, the last time they played, Cleveland controlled the clock, 36 minutes, and, and Cincinnati turned it over. They couldn't protect. They're protecting much better now. Uh, and I, this is a game where a little bit like the Raider game tonight where, you know, Cincy's toughness, their ability to get control of the game is going to be really critical. And the way Burrow is playing, I would not doubt Cincinnati. I mean, I have it as a 7.21 game. Ooh. And Cincinnati's numbers the last few weeks have been incredible. The last five weeks, they have been really good. You know, and they're so good in so many areas. They're, they're, you know, in the fourth quarter, they're the, fourth, they're, they're, the punts per play is, is low. The last 10 games are the fifth best team in the country, in, 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 the, in the NFL. So I, I like Cincinnati a lot here. Yeah, Cincinnati, if they keep winning, maybe Burrow MVP. That chatter will start to get louder and louder after what he did last week against the Kansas City Chiefs. Ravens at the Steelers, one of my favorite games every single season whenever these two teams play. Uh, Baltimore, two-and-a-half-point dogs. Tyler Huntley, we're expecting to be the starter. They haven't officially ruled Lamar out, but you can go ahead and read the tea leaves and look at the injury report. Lamar, I doubt he's going to play in this game. Total 36-and-a-half here. Uh, The Steelers have also been playing much better over the last handful of weeks here. No doubt. They've played really good. I mean, look, Tomlin's such a good coach. He gets his team ready to go. They play so well. 
you know, and, and, you know, and they haven't turned the ball over in the last three weeks, which has been critical to their success, right? They've gotten Pickett to stop turning the ball over, and they've been able to run the football a little bit, you know, and, and look, they, if they can run the ball against Baltimore, which will be a challenge, you know, that's going to be that, – that'll be the game, and they can keep the game close. But these games are always close. Mm-hmm. These games always are back and forth no matter what the level of the teams are. I think what Pittsburgh's been really good defensively. Do you know they're the second-best team in the National Football League in, in having the most incompletions? Wow. I, didn't I mean, know that. They, they play the they, – they get the ball, you throw in – and this is going to be a hard game for Baltimore. So, you know, and both teams are good in turnovers, takeaway. The, the, Pittsburgh's the eighth-best team in that category, which, which has improved a long way. So – I mean, to me, this is about Pittsburgh not messing up the game, keeping it close into the fourth quarter, and it's always going to be a field goal game. AFC West rivalry renewed. Chiefs and the Broncos, Kansas City, nine-point favorites in the Rocky Mountains, total 44 here. Yeah, I mean, look, I I, I mean, I don't know. I'm going to ask <laughs> you this question. I asked it yesterday to Ben on the uh, Lombardi line. Mm-hmm. If the if the Broncos got the ball in college rules overtime at the 25-yard line and, and you gave them five times, to the, how many points do you think they'd score? I mean, <laughs> like The correct answer is 15 because they would make every field goal. They would never get it in the end zone. That's the correct answer. I just don't know how they keep pace with the Chiefs. They played them well last year, as shitty as they were. They did play mm-hmm. them well at home. And frankly, they should have beat them. I mean, they should have beat them. Drew Locke. You know, they turned the ball. They're going in for a touchdown. They turned mm. the ball over. But, look, here's a different – to mm. me, this game, the last five weeks, Kansas City's fourth best team in football. The Broncos the 23rd. I mean, the Broncos are really bad in almost every single statistical category you can look at. Defensively, though, they've been playing pretty well, and they know how to make these games ugly. If they bring Kansas City down to the mud, maybe this ends up being a Chiefs 20 to – Six kind of game. Who yeah, knows but don't you happens. think the Chiefs are going to play better after that loss in Cincinnati? I think they are. Yeah, I'd guess so. But, you know, hey, who yeah, knows? Weird things I mean, happen in, in the Rocky Mountains there. Uh, let's go over to the Bay Area, though, Michael. Tom Brady and the Buccaneers are underdogs, three-and-a-half-point underdogs against Brock Purdy and the 49ers, total 37. Now, it's not just Brady versus Purdy. There's a lot of other uh, variables at play here. But it is just interesting to see that Brock Purdy is a favorite against Tom Brady. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it's the 49er defense is a favorite. Mm-hmm. I think it's the Bucks' lack of offensive powers. I mean, you know, if Mark Ingram gets that first down, we would be, th- this might be a six-point line. Think about it, right? No, I mean, if he, I, I think he hurt his knee on that play. That's why he ran out of bounds. If he gets that first down against the, the Bucks, that, that game's over. That's two more minutes going to come off the clock. That game's really going to change. So, I, I don't – the Bucks' offense is, to me, as we've documented on this pod, broken. I think Purdy's going to have an ability to throw a lot of easy throws. I mean, I don't know what hard throw he's going to have to make because all the receivers, all the skill players on San Francisco teams are great yards after the catch. I mean, they all are yards after the catch. The whole offense is built yards after the catch. Mm-hmm. So unless he gets behind by two touchdowns, I gotta, he'll be effective. He's got 46 career college starts. The Niners' defense has got to put pressure on Brady and, you know, and not allow them to run the football, which it's hard to do on San Francisco. Could be another big game for Nick Bosa, especially if Tristan Wirfs is unable to play on Sunday. They're Bosa against a backup tackle. That doesn't sound like a good recipe if you're Tampa Bay. Finally, Sunday night football, Dolphins at the Chargers. Miami three-and-a-half-point road favorites, total 51-and-a-half. I know you'll have your eyes on this one, Michael. Oh, I can't wait. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> the, the two of love? You know, two is number one in Pro Bowl voting. It's amazing. When you can get a campaign like this, it's pretty impressive. It's really impressive. I mean – you know, the people that organize these campaigns, I think they're missing their calling. They should have been in the political world. I mean, because they can do some damage. I mean, to me, Tua is the MVP, is, is the leader in Pro Bowl voting for quarterback. Okay. All right. Okay. See, this is why I see a different game than everybody else sees, okay? Mm-hmm. That, that, that's the case, you know? I mean, I heard somebody on the Worldwide Leader saying Tua played well last week. I, I mean, literally, yeah. I was flipping the channels, and I heard somebody, and I heard Stephen A. arguing with, I won't mention the name, but, the, you know, even Stephen A. was, in, it was like, going crazy on the guy. Like, are you kidding me? No. But, I, that, I you know, but they see a different game. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, look, the Chargers, this is their season. They, they, yep. I mean, I have no faith in the Chargers. I like Miami. I, I think Miami will move the ball on the Chargers. That Charger defense has not got we, – we documented last week on the show. They haven't gotten better mm-hmm. since Staley's been there. 
Yeah, I like Miami, too, in this game. I don't see how they stop them, whether it's throwing or passing. Miami's defense is suspect as well, so maybe we'll see a lot of points. The total is indicating that we will with 51.5, but I think the Dolphins will, will win this game. And 3.5, uh, yeah, we wouldn't really want to lay that, but I think Miami has a good chance to cover on Sunday night. All right, well, that does it for us this week on the podcast, Michael. Should be a fun Week fourteen I love this season, that you got Dan Campbell two hundred to yeah. one. I love two hundred to one. I, I it was I, I purchased it just this week. It was, it was like, hey, you know it what? It just shows you how how little you listen to me when you vote for when you take that ticket out. It's it's really it was a little you know, sprinkle. I show Michael, you my hand and you slap it away. It's like Uncle Junior says, I show you my hand, you slap it away. <laughs> Betting Dan Campbell got, when you do a podcast with me is so disrespectful. It's so disrespectful. That's why you hid the Tua ticket. There's but no I get it. Ticket. I understand. I'm it's not all, afraid. I know. I know. It's all the number for you, Femi. I know. It's, it's uh, you're a classic. I, I've just took the number. It's, it's a juicy price, man. Two hundred to one. They have a favor, took the number. Favorable schedule. I love that. I, took I just took the number. <laughs> I just took the number. <laughs> We'll see you that. We'll see you Monday, Femi. Thank you. <laughs> I'll see you on Monday as we recap week 14. Thank you to our producer, Elliot Bowman, on the ones and twos. Thank you to you guys as well for listening and viewing. Thank you to DraftKings. Thank you to VEASAN. Subscribe, rate, and review, and we'll talk to you guys after week 14. Thanks for watching the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi. And for more videos like this, make sure to subscribe to VEASAN Live and the GM Shuffle podcast with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VEASAN, wherever you get your podcasts.